Thank you. As Joshua mentioned, I am at the Open Source Hardware Association. We call it Oshawa for short. And we are sort of the business trade arm of open source hardware, the standards organization. Um, we host the community driven definition of what open source hardware is so that everybody can kind of be on the same page about it. And we were really born out of industry. So there was a bunch of industries doing open source hardware who all got together and said, wait a minute, we all have to like know exactly what we're talking about when we say the words open source hardware, like what is it? So um, this is one of the reasons that we exist is to basically tell everybody what open source hardware is. We are funded by many, many different businesses, companies, organizations. We um, recently went into the grant field, so the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation is up there as, um, as one of the, the foundations that has given us a grant, but otherwise, um, we have always been funded by um, businesses, industry, corporations, um, many of those up there that you, you've probably heard of before, Autodesk, Intel, Google, places like that. All right, so what is open source hardware, first of all? Open source hardware is the, the ability to remix, remake, remanufacture, redistribute, resell, and study and learn from that hardware. So this allows anybody in the world to basically recreate your thing, make a business out of it, and sell those products. So what is the source? The source is anything needed to make a copy. Right? So if somebody is able to replicate your design somewhere else in the world, you know that you have officially put out enough of your source so that anybody can make a copy of it. What this looks like um, is schematics, CAD files. Again, if you're engineering students, you probably know exactly what those things are. This looks like code or firmware. Um, this also might look like hand drawings. There might not be any tech involved in open source hardware at all. When we talk about open source hardware, we're talking about anything created with bits, rather, or anything with atoms rather than bits. I have said that sentence so many times in my life, I'm amazed I screwed that up. So all of these things, the source, are things that are copyrightable, all right? So when we're talking about open source hardware, those are usually things, right, hardware is a patentable item. The things that are the source are usually copyrightable items. These are your plans, again, your schematics, code, right, written things that are typically pr protected by copyright. Copyright is super easy because it's automatically granted to you in, in most places in the world. So you don't have to do anything at all to actually you know, get your copyright. Now, a patent is very much different than that. Um, so hardware is protected by patents, right? So with patents, um, the, the hardware, you would apply for the patent that you have your innovation on. Um, in the US, that's about $50,000. Um, I'm not sure what it is in Canada, but we have very similar patent systems in general. Um, so in hardware, with uh, when you would get a patent, so hardware is actually born free. It is not locked down until you patent it. So this is what's really interesting about open source hardware then. So people would say, well, wait a minute. If it's all born free, why would you need to even call it open source hardware? And the answer is we, we really don't, except that we want to show our intention, right? So we want to make it really obvious, like, yeah, I didn't just forget to get a patent. I'm not trying to do a trade secret over here. I really do intend for people to create copies of this, to remanufacture it, to resell it, to redistribute it, whatnot. So it's all about really showing your intention. And one of the things, um, you know, that you all probably heard of back in 2020 was the pandemic, right? Everybody remember that? Probably don't want to remember that. Um, one of the things that we really saw the power of during the pandemic was open, was open source hardware. So everybody started making face masks. There was tons of online tutorials about how to use a sewing machine, how to sew one of these things, some sewing patterns, right? All of that is this entire system of open source hardware. All of that was based on the ability to put enough source out there in the world so that another person could remake it in their localized, you know, global position in the world. So one of the other things that happened 
um, is this face shield over here that is from the University of Wisconsin. So the University of Wisconsin put out this face shield as a piece of open source hardware. They said, here are all the plans. You can laser cut it using this pattern. You can, here's this little foam piece that you put on the top. Here's all the you know, ways of adhering that foam piece and the dimensions that it has to be. Ford ended up taking this face shield and making it in the millions. And that happened within days, right? We had to move extremely fast and extremely efficient during the pandemic. If we had to have the University of Wisconsin's lawyers talking to Ford lawyers, does anybody have a guess of how long they would have taken to come to an agreement over the intellectual property? Any IP people in the world, in, in the room? No, I don't know either, right? But you can imagine it's definitely longer than just having something open source, they can just download it from the internet and start making it that day. All right, so how is this situated in legal, right? So. What open source hardware runs on, because people in our community do not tend to get patents, you certainly can if you want to. You could spend the money to get the patents. However, most industries in open source hardware actually, we're, we're trying to like leverage open source hardware as a way of moving away from a really expensive and really slow intellectual property system. So a lot of patents can take years to get and most companies who are innovating really quickly, who are on the cutting edge of technology, are usually making their innovations better within those couple years. And so the patent, by the time they get it, is kind of for an old piece of technology they might not even be selling anymore. So um, what we do is we leverage trademarks in open source hardware. So we say, hey, we are this company here with this name and this brand, and they rely on brand loyalty. They rely on everybody being able to know exactly who they are. Um, trademarks are there to protect the consumer. They are not necessarily there to protect a company. They're really there to, to let a consumer know exactly who that company is, the fact that you can be rest assured that you are talking to that same company and that nobody else is using that, other, that company's name, right? Um, so one of the things um, that was mentioned, right, is, is this concept of like giving attribution for open source hardware, right? So when you create a piece of open source hardware and maybe you go and make a copy of it, you want to make a business out of it, right, which you're totally free to do, the thing that you're not allowed to do is say, oh, okay, cool, I found this you know, piece of SparkFun hardware in the certification. I'm going to make a copy of it. You cannot use SparkFun's name. Right, because that is their trademark. And so when you're talking about attribution, you say, yes, on the website or in a readme file somewhere on your GitHub platform, you can say, oh, yes, this is, you know, I'm giving attribution to SparkFun. They made the original product, um, which is great marketing, by the way, for, for your products and devices. And, and, you know, here is how I'm giving attribution, but you're not allowed to use their trademark, their name. You're not allowed to say this was created by SparkFun. The other thing that open source hardware does, which is the same as the patent system, is it gives prior art. So we are able to have a sort of play within a system that has been around for you know, thousands of years, um, and, or no, hundreds of years, and, uh, and, and really be able to take the power of prior art and apply it to open source hardware as well. So prior art just means that you have disclosed your innovation you know, with the internet nowadays. Um, it used to be only with the patent and trade office before the internet. Um, but now that we can share ideas so much faster and so much more globally, we can create lots and lots of prior art out there, out there with open source hardware. And the prior art basically says, this is prior art, this inv invention has already been disclosed, therefore you cannot get a patent on top of prior art when the invention has already been disclosed. And then usually um, people use an alternative to copyright within open source hardware. There's lots of different flavors of this, so that's why it's just alternative copyright and not one specific license for copyright. There's copy left out there, there's Creative Commons, there's all kinds of different types of um, copyright alternatives. And so if you're creating documentation, if you're creating code, if you're creating firmware that goes along with your hardware, all of that copyrightable stuff is licensed under sort of a, a, an alternative to copyright that is open source as well. 
And then finally, the Open Source Hardware Association provides a certification. And the certification, this is like this little certification logo up here, gives you a country code and a unique identifier number. So people can go to the certification database, and I think uh, we have around 2,600-ish uh, certified things in our, in our database. And people can go there and then look up what the you know, open hardware thing is, where it's from, and get the unique identifier code, see that we have certified it as open source hardware. We said, yes, we double checked. The source is all there. Um, and then you can also click through and um, find that source. Usually, you know, people use leverage the click through button to, to go to their website. Um, so that also drives traffic to their website. And then the source will be linked from there. So the certification um, was kind of, uh, we came up with as, you know, something that our community said, hey, we really want a little bit more teeth in this whole crazy concept of open source hardware. Because to be very clear, this is not just public domain, right? So putting your, your hardware in the public domain, it's ironic that we kind of call it open source because the public domain is actually like much more open than open source hardware. So, um, but what we're doing is we're saying, look, we do actually want a couple levers in place like that thing about attribution, the thing about um, viral licenses, right? If you put it in the public domain, people could license it however they want. People could, you know, basically um, close down an open thing if they wanted. Um, so we wanted to be able to say, okay, you do want a little bit of teeth. You want people to, um, you know, keep it open. You want people to um, make sure that they, they even understand and know what your licenses are, and you want attribution for that. That's fine. We agree. Um, the, those are all great things to have a, especially as a business, right, to have, and we started out of industry, we started out of all these businesses and companies who wanted to build open hardware. So we need to give you something um, that's like, you know, sort of a framework for an agreement of what all these different um, companies are going to be building open source hardware. So that's basically what the certification does. And it is, um, we're hoping, um, it is also a database for prior art itself, so people can go and see what prior art is already up there, and it can hopefully be used as a lever um, to ensure that things are not patented over. All right, so what are the benefits of open sourcing? So first of all, right, you get attribution, or in academia, a lot of times attribution is more so uh, known as citation, right? So you get kind of like a citation of your work, um, but you get attribution, and again, this is a great marketing tool. So when somebody, when another business creates a derivative of your business, they have to point back to your original company and say, hey, I'm bringing in new communities over here with this derivative piece of open source hardware, but I'm going to let everybody know that you were the original creator of that open hardware, and then people can kind of trickle back and find their way to your company, which might be a completely different market that you serve. You get provenance. So when um, Dr. Pierce was talking about the 3D printers, Right, having a parent and a child that is like provenance of your hardware, so you can kind of see the family tree. Or often in open hardware, it just—it's kind of this explosion looks more like a bush than a tree. Um, you also get access to um, CERN's open hardware license suite. Has anybody heard of CERN here with their Large Hadron Collider? A couple people. Okay, so there are an enormous scientific organization in Europe. Um, that most European companies pay into, and they, um, you know, they're studying like our entire universe, for example, um, and so they created a licensing system for open source hardware, and um, this was it was really incredible because you've got this enormous scientific body who has a convention to release their inventions publicly. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that the way to make a piece of hardware generally accessible would be to put it in the open hardware suite. Um, so to ensure that, they created a license suite out of it. And the thing about CERN is um, you know, they're well established. They've been around since the 40s. They're not going anywhere. So having such an enormous place utilize open source hardware in the way that they're going to write the licenses for it is really huge. So they've got all kinds of different licenses for hardware. Also encourages community and collaboration. I know some of our um, speakers this afternoon will be talking about that. 
creates prior art, as we talked about in the last slide. And it also really incentivizes innovation. So when we're talking about open source, I like to say it's, it's capitalism with a capital C, right? It's not hiding behind a 20-year monopoly that a patent might give you. Um, so remember, the whole concept of the patent system also was to create innovation. But it's really hard to create innovation when you're going to lock it up for 20 years and not let anybody create anything else like that, or you're going to sue the pants off them. That doesn't really create innovation either. That just creates lawsuits. And I happen to be an American, so we really love suing people over and on our side of the border there. Um, and so, but, but again, like that, that doesn't do anything for innovation. If we're really interested in pushing innovation forward, if we're interested in disrupting markets, the way to do that is not through lawsuits, right? Um, so, so the open source hardware system was really born out of a bunch of inventors who say, the patent system's too, too slow. I can't uh, leverage my invention if I have to wait a couple years to get a patent. And then this whole 20-year monopoly. Who has a cell phone in here that's 20 years old? Nobody's using their cell phone from 20 years ago? Oh, because innovation goes faster than that, right? You want the better product that's out there. You want the more efficient thing. You want the thing that's got battery life still. So innovation just does not work on this cycle anymore. Um, and what we find um, even within patents, right, is that, is that now you've got an entire system created um, to incentivize these inventions on paper, but no incentive to actually create the product. And so for, again, innovation to really happen, we also need a disruptive business model, which is open source hardware, so that all of those um, patents can kind of hang out by themselves and sit in the corner on their paper over there, and we can be busy building the actual hardware and selling those devices somewhere else. All right, so what, all, what makes this all tick? So I forgot to mention, um, Open Source Hardware Association has been around for over 10 years now. Uh, we started in 2010. Um, and there are, there's been different things that, especially around that time, were, were changing very rapidly. And the reasons that people were making open source hardware um, were, were you know, the reasons on this slide here. So materials were getting cheaper. So that meant that more people could create things in their localized environments. And it wasn't like you know, the, the, the price of plastic or the price of copper was like so inhibitive that only a billion dollar company could do it anymore. People were finding community. So one of the blowbacks from the internet, right, where we all kind of like shut ourselves inside and we're like, whoa, internet, this is cool. We all wanted community. We all wanted physical spaces again to, to meet people. And so this really started a, a huge um, hackerspace and makerspace movement where people were starting to come together and say, oh, right, we remember being in a physical room with all you people instead of in our dorm rooms online. So people wanted to find their community. And in large cities especially, people also want to do like tool sharing, right? So when I was uh, you know, first getting started in this movement, um, I was in New York City. In New York City, rent's extremely expensive. We couldn't just all have a bandsaw in our apartment or all have a drill press or even a 3D printer right at that point in time. So we all got together, we pooled our money, we got a collective space, and we started um, utilizing collective tools. Now, there's a lot of public libraries that do this um, now. There's a lot of places, uh, tool share programs that say, hey, we know that not everybody needs their own drill press all the time, so you can come here and use our drill press whenever you need it. Global markets are also becoming more accessible, again, due to the internet. Um, and so I think like this goes without saying, and once again, you know, during the pandemic, having just incredible amounts of sharing happening through, throughout the globe, right? Oh, you need this material over here? Okay, like, let's figure out what kind of material you might have at your fingertips, and maybe we can figure out a, a way to 3D print something for you over there, and we can figure out some, some sellable things over here, and we can figure out... We, we basically all had to go back to distributed manufacturing during the pandemic and to really make things for the places that needed those items. Networks are defaulting to sharing. 
I think the best example of this is when you um, search for an image, right? You probably make slide presentations all the time. And you're searching the internet for an image, right? How many people really go in and dive in deep to find out who owns the copyright on that image? Like nobody? <gasps> okay. And that's fine, right? People are changing. People are saying, oh, oops, like, okay, so, you know, I don't know who owns the copyright. That is because that's not really the way that we function anymore. We kind of function in this new way of saying, oh, somebody put up an image on the internet. I can use it, right? We are defaulting to sharing. We're saying it's okay to share. And legally, that is absolutely not correct. And legally, somebody could sue you for using their image. And of course, this certainly has happened, especially when Facebook used some image of a child without permission. Um, but overall, networks are defaulting to sharing. They're saying like, yeah, 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 I get it. I posted that online. I know what's going to happen there. I know that's going to be like utilized and like copied and pasted and whatever. And if I didn't want it that like that done to my picture, I probably wouldn't put that online, right? Um, and so then, at times, of course, necessity, right? So um, again, the pandemic really showed us that um, this is when when you need to innovate fast, when you need to innovate efficiently, when you need things made all over the world you actually open source everything. Medtronic was a huge, well is, a huge ventilator company in the US. And they did a similar thing to Elon Musk, right? They said, hey, we're gonna open source our patents as long as you don't use them against us, which is like, isn't really quite open sourcing, but it's a step in the right direction, we'll give it to them. They said, um, please help us engineer a better ventilator, please help us create more of these we need more, we can't make them fast enough, we can't innovate fast enough. So they had to release some of their patents and say, it's okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna sue you, you don't have to be afraid of that. All right, so I wanna talk to you a little bit about business and open source hardware. Um, so I've got a number of examples here. Um, most of these uh, examples, all of these examples, um, are supporters of the Open Source Hardware Association um, and have been doing open source hardware for a really long time and have all created extraordinarily successful businesses uh, in open hardware. So um, this is a picture of Lulzbot and our next presenter will talk a lot more about Lulzbot. Um, this is a 3D printing company and this picture I thought would be interesting to show because I'm not sure if You've got pictures of the Colorado plant in your presentation. But this picture um, is a photograph of, of the company when it was in Colorado. It's not in Colorado anymore because it was so successful it got bought. And so now it is in North Dakota. There is uh, another company that we'll be talking to you later today called iFixit. This is a really interesting model because they don't make open hardware, they make a service. They tell people how to fix their hardware, right? They tell people how to, they, they give people basically the instructions to fix their dryer, their dishwasher, or their phone screen. Um, they basically are selling confidence to fix your own device. This is something that people used to do all the time, right? We would we would never think like, oh, I'm gonna buy a car or a washing machine or a sewing machine and not know how to fix it myself when it breaks. However, as things get smaller, right, all these little chips that we deal with now are not, no longer on a human scale, they're on this computational scale. So it gets much, much more difficult to um, actually fix your thing when you can't see all the different parts in your thing or when you need a specialized tool to fix that thing. Um, and we're lacking a lot of the repair manuals that used to be there. So, again, not every business model has to deal with manufacturing the hardware itself and selling that hardware. Um, this is SparkFun, which is another one of the um, companies that we'll be talking to later today. And they are so successful as an open source hardware company, they were able to build a building for their manufacturing plant, so they also own all the real estate that is uh, producing all that open source hardware. <clears throat> um, this is a company called Beagle Bone. 
Um, and beagle bone's really interesting because this is actually Texas Instruments. Do you all have, like in the US, every high school student has a TI calculator. Do you all have those here or not? Yeah? OK, I'm seeing lots of nods. OK, so Texas Instruments is an enormous company. It is uh, one, of the, one of their plans of how to get kind of like integrated, how to get all their chips integrated, was this whole concept of like giving every student or making every student buy, rather, a Texas Instruments calculator in high school, right? So that gives them brand recognition with every single high schooler and anybody going into engineering. They paid a lot of money at a bunch of different engineering schools to say, hey, just leverage our chips, okay? So then the open source hardware movement came along and they said, oh wait, we want a piece of that too, that's really interesting. So they actually started a spin-off company called BeagleBoard um, and they create uh, these open source hardware uh, single board computers um, to, as kind of the way of saying like, yes, Texas Instruments is also involved in this whole open source hardware game. Um, Arduino microcontroller, um, you all have uh, heard of this. This is, this is what it is right here. Um, so Arduino, just a couple years back, said, hey, we, we just sold our 10 millionth microcontroller. And this is about 20 to 30 US dollars to buy. And so you can do the math. This piece of open source hardware has made 200 to 300 million dollars at this point. Um, it's a really great little platform. Um, and it's interesting because it actually came out of uh, an art and design school. And they said, we want an art and design platform to use for ourselves. And what's happened is that all the engineering schools has, have actually picked it up and said, oh, wait, that is a really nice platform. And the user experience here is fantastic. We, wanna, we want a good user experience, too. So this is also a really great example of these disruptive markets that can happen within open source hardware when you're not just thinking of the community that you've always had as a customer base, when you're thinking a little bit more outside of the box and wondering, you know, what can a different market bring to our industry? This is exactly the kind of example that you're looking for. Um, this is Lamour. Um, she's the CEO of Adafruit. Lamour has had such an ex a successful open source hardware company. She can manufacture devices in Manhattan. And actually, her uh, company is on Varick Street, which is just a couple blocks off of Wall Street. Um, so I was like really kind of bringing in the proximity of how close open source hardware is to Wall Street. This is Eric Pan. Um, he, this is the uh, Forbes uh, 30 under 30 um, cover in China. So he runs the studio. Uh, he runs the company Seed Studio, and um, he has been an incredibly successful um, entrepreneur in China, and um, is really interested in kind of taking open source hardware to the next level. Um, not only in China, but also outside of China. So I think this is a really great example of also how we can work together and innovate with China. Um, he's selling his hardware all around the globe. Um, but it's also really great to think about um, one of the use cases for open source hardware can be that your industry may not be able to you know, really be in a different country, right? Like we all, even though networks have become so global, even though the internet exists and we can all share information and data and websites and whatever, it often takes a lot more to actually get a product into a specific country or into a particular community, right? So if you speak multiple languages, that's, you know, a great way to be able to communicate with people, right? Obviously. Um, but when, you, when you're able to write documentation in different languages, you can then span into different communities that you may not have necessarily um, you know, had considered to begin with. Um, and so that's one of the things that, that um, open hardware is really powerful at, ooh, is, is having a derivative network where the derivatives can actually be like, oh, I know how to get this product 
over here in a language that's not written right now in the documentation, I can translate that and I can sell it over there in that country. And I understand the, the tax implications of selling in that country and the tariff in, implications and whatever else is going on. Or maybe you can just do it cheaper. That's okay too. All right, this business um, is a, a music business uh, or business in the music industry um, called Winterbloom. And this entrepreneur left her cushy job at Google, where she was making loads of money, to produce her own, to create her own company and produce open source hardware. All right, so I've talked a lot about a bunch of different businesses here. Most of these that I've talked about are all in the electronics business, um, or in the electronics world, right? However, open source hardware is more than just microcontrollers, even though we kind of got our start in electronics, we got our start in industry. There's a lot more. Um, it was already mentioned. There's um, cars. We've got environmental sensors. We've got um, crocheting. There's jewelry that's open source hardware. There's medical equipment that's open source hardware. Um, recently, my most uh, my mo most favorite recent certification was actually for perfume. So we also have perfume as open source hardware. So we're a lot bigger than just electronics and microcontrollers, even though that's where we started. So let's say that you have no interest in hardware, and you don't even know how to build hardware. Um, there's also business use cases for being the platform that people are selling their open hardware on, right? So this is Tindy, um, and they are a platform to sell your already built hardware, okay? Which is different than CrowdSupply, which is a platform to fund your open source hardware. Um, and so you can see like the the one on the upper on your upper right there is what at like two point is that two point nine million? My screen's too small. Um, but this is the, all of the things on Crowd Supply are are open hardware, and they are their business model is yes we you know kind of take a percentage to use as a crowdfunding mechanism. So this is for um, entrepreneurs who have not yet created their hardware to gain the capital that they need to create their hardware. Tindy, on the other hand, is not the crowd supplying kind of platform. It is, you know, you already created your hardware and this is where people know to come look for open source hardware so that they can buy it. And then we've also gotten into consumer products. So this is a desktop computer that's open source hardware and software. They also sell laptops, keyboards, mice, things like that. So we're not just in these like you know, little worlds where you have to know how to plug in wires into a microcontroller to make a little LED blinker, things like that. We're also very much into the um, into consumer hardware. Um, we also have open source hammocks. This is another one of my favorite examples. Um, so again, not just microcontrollers and consumer devices here that people can take a hammock with them, camping, um, all the straps and the hammock itself uh, to, you know, bolt this to a couple of trees in your backyard or whatnot are all open source hardware. All right, so now I wanna talk a minute about venture capital and open source hardware. So you might say, oh, this is fine, but really what our business is worth. So um, this is MakerBot in, in their very, very young stages. They were an open source hardware company who took venture capital money and they ended up selling for $403 million. So that's real money. Now, what they didn't do was think through the intellectual property agreements when they signed on with their venture capitalists. So their venture capitalists end up owning the intellectual property agreements and against um, the founder's wishes, ended up closing it down. And I should say, you know, the entire 3D printing business came from one of the patents, a patent that that um, Stratasys owned, um, basically being put in the public domain. It was no longer, it was at the end of its 20 year monopoly, right? And what we saw was the example from the University of Bath where people started making a desktop 3D printer. Stratasys hadn't even thought of that, right? Um, so once that patent was up, innovation just boomed in the 3D printing industry. Um, and so what happened after MakerBot sold for $403 million, 
and then closed down was their community really turned on them. And they said, wait a minute. Like, why would we buy something that's not open source? We've, we've gotten used to this concept of, like, you're going to share the innovations with us, your community. And so, um, so now, you know, I used to go all over to hackerspaces, to schools, universities, and I would see um, MakerBots all the time. And then they closed down. And what I have seen is maybe, maybe one or two collecting dust somewhere. But for the most part, I see Lulzbots everywhere. I see Perusa Mandels everywhere. I see people having their own 3D printers, right? Like that industry does not need patents anymore. That's not a, a selling point for that industry. That's not why people buy them. All right, and then we've learned in the open hardware industry about venture capital. So here's a different example of venture capital and open source hardware. So this is an open source pick and place machine. Um, this is created by Opulo. And Opulo learned from MakerBot's mistakes. And they said, OK, I'm going to take what's called safe VC, which is a simple agreement arrangement. Um, and that's what the S and the A stand for. Um, so with safe VC, it's, it's a very, it's a much more simple agreement than you've got with like a lot of different VC models. And it allows um, a entrepreneur to keep more of their company and not lose important decisions like where the IP is going to go. So they took safe VC funding. Um, Arduino has also taken some VC funding. Um, so VC in this world has definitely had a, an, an impact. Um, and we've also like learned what to do and what not to do. If you don't know about safe um, VC funding, it's, really, it's a really, really interesting model in terms of if you're interested in keeping a little bit more of your IP and, and not kind of giving away uh, more of your company. All right, so pop quiz, why do consumers buy things? Who knows? Who can tell me one reason? You, right there? Why do consumers buy things? Oh, you have a problem and you need to fix it. Any, anybody else? Do you ever buy like maybe a shirt based on the size? Does anybody do that in here? Buy things based on, yeah. Yeah, I do that. You do that. Do you, <laughs> what's another reason you might buy something? You like how it looks. Excellent. You might, oh, yeah. Satisfy your needs. Excellent. Yes? For efficiency. Good answer. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so for su based on the company support that it gives, yeah. To make yourself happy, awesome. So none of those answers are that you buy things because of patents, because typically buy people buy things based on features, color, customer service, price, shipping, brand loyalty, quality, user experience, endorsements, availability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You probably like go through this in Business 101, right? That's why people buy things. How many people in here have bought things based on the number of patents it has? OK, I ask this question in every single lecture I give. I've never had one person raise their hand. They buy something because of a patent. That's just not how we shop, right? So when you think about this from the cons consumer perspective, consumers do not care what intellectual prop property comes with a particular device. Um, you don't care if it's got 17 patents or 37 patents. To consumers, that does not signify a better product or a product that they even they need, want, or desire. Happiness does not end with patents. Um, all right. So can open source hardware survive just on this concept of trademark alone? So in the United States, um, the Patent and Trade Office has has decided that there are things that are basic human needs. And those human needs, you're not able to patent or copyright. One of those human needs is clothing, right? Everybody needs clothing. So the US Patent and Trade Office said, OK, we cannot patent or copyright clothing. 
everybody needs it, that would be a disaster. So what happened is that the fashion industry survives on trademark. And when you have to survive on trademark, you create a winter collection, a fall collection, a spring collection, and a summer collection. They innovate f four times a year. They sell us things we don't necessarily need, maybe, but we want it. It makes us happy to have that shirt that just got released by Louis Vuitton, right? So can open hardware survive on trademark? Can industry survive on trademark when they're not surviving on patents? Absolutely, because we've seen what the fashion industry does, and there is no lack of survival of fashion, right? Even though people have clothing, we still all go out and buy the newest, latest, greatest clothing. All right, so now I have talked to you um, about a lot of American companies, and I'm really sorry about that. I did try my best to get some Canadian companies in here, but the fact of the matter is there are not a whole lot of open hardware can Canadian companies out there right now. There are some companies that are using open hardware products. There are companies who have dabbled in it for one or the other. But this could be an incredible disru disruptive business market for Canada. And I really hope that you all can say, like, hey, I was in the room when like, we talked about bringing open hardware to Canada that first time, the first time that I heard about open hardware and that being... A Canadian thing, right? We want this all over the world. Um, and our certifications are on every single continent except for Antarctica. Uh, and we're working with some scientists there to bring open hardware to Antarctica. But, um, and there's certainly certified products that are in Canada. But as far as the business piece goes, I think that's uh, something that you all could really leverage um, that, ha that isn't being leveraged here currently. And to help you out with that, uh, we are bringing our Open Hardware Summit. Um, this will be like the 14th or 15th summit um, that uh, will be the first time in Canada. So this will be in Montreal in 2024 in, uh, I want to say it's May 3rd and 4th um, that our summit is going on. So I invite you all to come and learn about um, other businesses who are coming to Canada, bringing Open Hardware here. and. Um, Hopefully, maybe even your business.